Welcome back to the program, Mom. Zev Brenner, Yehuda Azulay, joined us again. He is assistant professor at York University, assistant principal at Torah High, which is part of NCSY, but he's founder of the Sephardic Legacy Series, and he's also the inaugurator of the inaugural tribute luncheon honoring the contribution of Sephardic Jewry in America, which will take place in November on Capitol Hill. He's written five books on great Sephardic giants, and he's in the process of writing a book about Rabbi Avadia Yosef, who just passed away, the great Torah giant. And the fact he was close to Rabbi Yovadi Yosef, he's writing a bio about him, as I mentioned. And he also was considered to lead this, the Shas party in the United States, which he declined. Uh, Yehuda, we appreciate you being here, part of our special broadcast, paying tribute to Rabbi Yovadi Yosef on his passing. Thank you so much for having me. When did you first meet the, the Chacham Yovadi Yosef? Okay, so roughly, I would say when I was 18, roughly 10 years ago, when I attended Yeshiva at Migdash Melech on Musei Shabbat on a Saturday night, many Yeshiva boys would literally pack up a van full of us and we would go and attend his Musei Shabbat weekly shiur. And that was the first time that I started getting familiar with the Chacham. And what impact did he have on your life? He impacted me simply because of his, not, not just because of his publications, of his Sfari, but as well as his influence his uh, well-encompassing approach to Torah mitzvot and, and just in general, in general, his approach to authenticity to so, towards Sephardic Judaism. And I believe that he carried the tradition as much as he was able to from the past generations till today. So he, his teacher was Chacham Ezra Atiyah, for example, in Parayat Yosef, and he passed that on, and unfortunately we uh, no longer have him around. So... Uh, Unfortunately, you were writing, or you were in the process of writing a biography about him. So, was were you cooper- was he cooperating with you? Were you sitting down with him to interview him? How was that process begun, and where are you up to in that whole book writing? Okay, so regarding the book entitled Maran, the life and and biography of Chacham Ovadia, I initially got permission from Rabbi Tzchak Yosef, the current Sephardic chief rabbi, two years ago, from him to which is Rabbi Ovadia Yosef's son. Okay. His son, Rav Yitzchak Yosef. Rav Avadi Yosef, I indirectly approached him through his shamash, and it wasn't the best. It wasn't the best approach because uh, he was he was definitely alive at the time, and I didn't want to step over anyone, including him. I know that numerous Hebrew publications, actually sixteen Hebrew biographies, came out on him, more than anyone I know of. Sixteen Hebrew biographies, and not one on English, and one of them was approached to him. And he told the author, what are you making my matziva? Are you making my, you know, tombstone? So once I heard that, I sort of backed off, and I didn't want to, to push that agenda. And I'm presently holding right now towards the, I would say, three-quarters uh, of the way, completion, towards completion. And I have two researchers currently in Israel assisting me, where we all studied all the 60, roughly 60 of, the svar, uh, of his svarim, from Yabia Omer and so on, and interviews, and within the family, and God willing, within uh, within a year's time, I should be done. He was somebody that was a great decisor, and also he was not afraid to speak out. He spoke his mind many a time. Oh, he definitely spoke out his mind. Is that definitely spoke his mind, right? Exactly. Sometimes he got himself in hot water by speaking out, but he never backed down. He never backed down. I mean, one thing: wh- whether one may agree or not agree with his comments and his well-known comments, I think what I really valued is, is he said what he had to say. He said what, what, what was on his mind. Most rabbis and most leaders today don't have that, and they're either afraid, and he definitely was, uh, was saying whatever was on his mind, and I think he had his, uh, his reasonings for it. Sometimes I believe also um, people around him unfortunately gave him the wrong information, which led to, to inaccurate... Uh, Comments, you know, inappropriate comments, potentially, but um, definitely he thought his mind, he, he definitely shared over his, uh, his mind to, to, to everyone. I only had the privilege of meeting him only one time about a year ago in Israel. There was a simcha in his shul, and we were there together with uh, Tarot Kohanim. I was there with Dr. Joe Frager, Dr. Paul Brody, and others. So we got a chance to daven. I had a chance to pray uh, with him, and we got uh, to spend a few moments with him. I remember he slapped my face twice. And uh, even at his advanced age, he was certainly full of charm. He certainly seemed, you know, strong and invigorated and uh, very impressive, very impressive. 
he had a great sense of humor. He really honestly did. He met my wife and my two daughters, and he was just joking with my wife, and he never met her before. And what 90-year-old man, what 90-year-old rabbi would, would do that today? I mean, it's just, it's, it's and for a gadol ador especially. So he was, he, he definitely had a, had a great personality as well, aside from his gadlut and Torah, and, um, and all throughout his accomplishments throughout his life. Now, he wrote a lot of responsa, and he certainly is, uh, not only for the Sephardic world, accepted, of course, by total jury, including the Ashkenazic world. What would you say his approach? Because I, I looked through some of his responsa, and it seemed that he was trying to, I guess you would call him in the spirit of Ramosha Fines, in the sense that he was more of a makel, more of somebody who tried to make things easier than try to be stringent. Yes, and I'm actually happy you asked me that. There's the concept of kocha de hetera adif, which is focused on leniency. He adopted the, the power, the power of, the, of, the, of making things impermissible is stronger than saying you know, anybody can say it. it takes a great rabbi. That's right. The power of leniency yes. is greater. That's was that that was his approach, and I think you know in general in Judaism, you know we, we have it hard enough in a sense. You know why should we have it any any harder? His goal was to make it. You know it's it's easy to be machmir in life. It's very easy for many of people, m- many many people out there. But it's it's harder to actually find that leniency, and that was his goal, and that was his objective, and that's why I like a lot of his psak halacha. Not because it was lenient and to take the easy road out, no, because it's the way life should be. Should, that's the way life should be lived, lived in, in a sense of leniency, in a sense of approaching towards God. That it should be come easy. That's all, and, and I definitely appreciated that. Now, since you're the biographer, you must have some interesting stories or insights that you're gathering for your book. So share with us. And uh, now that uh, unfortunately he's no longer with us, share with us some of the interesting stories or insights or thoughts or that you've heard. Sure, absolutely. There's the famous one when people always asked him why he was praying for Mubarak, you know, and and he told them he told them the story that 28 years ago he went with Aryeh Deri to Egypt, and he heard that Husseini Mubarak was about to build a highway over an old Jewish cemetery, where a lot of Gedolei Torah were even buried there. So he actually flew out there, took a helicopter, flew out there, and and he had a meeting with Hussein Mubarak, both publicly discussing the cemetery issue, and Hussein Mubarak, actually, it was millions of dollars to reroute the the highway, which was going to go over this Jewish cemetery, and thanks to Chacham Uvad Yosef, he did that, and that's, it's, it's in his merit for that. And then he met with him privately, and when he met with him privately, he asked, Husseini Mubarak asked Chacham Uvadi for a beracha, for a blessing. I find that actually phenomenal, that an Arab leader, and um, according to many, a dictator, is, um, was, asked, was asking the, not only chief rabbi at the time, but the Gadol Adar for a, a, for a blessing. And also, by the way, Chacham Uvadi Yosef was the chief rabbi of Cairo in uh, the late 1930s, early 40s. Interesting. And, uh, I just find that phenomenal. That but only, by the way, that that's not an exception, though, because I don't remember who. I don't know if it was Chacham of Adi Yosef or different Chacham. Isn't there a story where King Hussein took one of the, the, one of the, the a Chacham in an airplane ride and they had some impact on him when they were together on a ride where he personally flew a Chacham? Yeah, yes, absolutely. It was, a, was that Chacham of Adi Yosef or was it a different Chacham? It was Baba Sali and Rabbi Baba Vadi Yosef in Damascus. It's a very lengthy story, but in a nutshell, well, what, was what they happened? had to, they had to uh, free an aguna in Damascus when when Jews lived in the time in Syria. You know, Jews still lived in the time. Uh, Jews lived in Syria during the sixties and seventies, so they had to take care of the situation. So both the Baba Sali and Rabbi Vadi Yosef went down there and had to take care of the situation. Well, they went down the to story, Syria. Th- there's different versions, but at the okay. end of the day, he always went out of his way for the rabbim, for the public. You know, at the end of the day, um, you take. Uh, for example, during the, during the Yom Kippur War, what rabbi, the only rabbi in the entire state of Israel that went out for, for, for the Agunot was him. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't sleep. There. It's, a famous, it's a famous story. I mean, so, and uh, just all these scenarios, people don't know the impact that he did. He was the first one to initiate the Israeli radio, believe it or not. And, what, and, do you, and, what do you mean? And, and, and enforce the kashrut. What about Israeli? What, how, what was his connection? In to order me? for communi- in order for proper communication, and also to his his, his main goal was to actually have the Vret Torah on the Israeli radio, which he was able to accomplish to get that done. Which he was able to accomplish. They had different versions that kept on collapsing within the Israeli uh, um, within the IDF. 
but he was always reinforcing the situation. I mean, he built schools, and he was very, very influential and, and effective. And I saw also his agenda. I was reading, reading a newspaper clip in Israel when he became chief rabbi. His, his, his attitude and his, and his personality was just, was just phenomenal, as well as his approach. He wanted to make uh, a united voice for, for rabbinical uh, leaders around the world. It was interesting. Of course, I don't. I don't believe that happened, but just his intentions were obviously were obviously poor. You know, Shas is definitely a different story within itself. But I believe, without a question, he uh, he definitely succeeded in, in some, if not most, areas. What area did he not succeed in? What area did he not succeed? Um, I think, I think in in trying to get out the. Sephardic second-class scenario that is still happening in the state of Israel, while in the United States and around the rest of the world there is no, there there isn't that issue. I think that it's still there. I even spoke to about him with him for two two years ago, and that issue is still there. Well, he tried to try to um, restructure that and reinforce that with his concept of which is returning the crown to its ancient glory and trying to go back to our heritage and trying to follow it. But at the end of the day, also, he had a very interesting approach, was to uh, sort of be like a melting pot. He wanted everybody to take their heritages and, and their customs and so on, and sort of make it all, um, con- you know, con- I guess, conclusive, and uh, to make it within one approach, even prayer, which is a Duta Mizrach, over Moroccan and, and any other customs. So I think in that regard, I mean, listen, it's an entire country at hand with millions of people. He definitely had had major influence, but I don't think he was successful in that regard. But it wasn't his, uh, his fault. I mean, he, when he got inaugurated as the chief rabbi, he got inaugurated in Ashkenaz synagogue, in the great synagogue of Tel Aviv. People asked him, why are you getting inaugurated in the, in the Ashkenaz synagogue? The customs to get inaugurated in the Sephardic synagogue in, uh, in Tel Aviv, which is called the Ohel Moed synagogue. And he says, no, I want to go and work with both the Ashkenazic communities that we should always work in everything we're doing together and show, and, and, and show that the differences could, be, could, could work out. And at the end of the day, I actually spoke to him about that, and he says it didn't work, meaning at the end of the day, there's still a big rift in between both, both segments. Both, uh, Even though they're talking about in Israel of, of abolishing a Sephardic chief rabbi, Ashkenazic chief rabbi, making just one chief rabbi for all of Israel. I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm totally fine with that. And, and by the way, his response have been accepted not only by the Sephardic world, also by the Ashkenazic, many segments of the Ashkenazic world, too. So his oh, impact absolutely. has been I've beyond been the, the Sephardic Rosh world. of Lakewood, learning, uh, learning Yabi Omer. And yeah, it's definitely well accepted. Every Bet Midrash, practically, that I've seen has his uh, responses. And many people are sort of against his responses because of his approach to, with an emphasis of Rav Yosef Karo, and as well as his leniencies. And as well, there are uh, other approaches against Kabbalah and uh, and so on, which is a different aspect. And as well as the Ben Ishchai, in the 50s they burnt his Farim, which was um, which was not directly negative the Ben Ishchai against the Ben Ishchai's approach, but it was um, it wasn't necessarily for his uh, responses the Ben Ishchai's. Mm-hmm. So they differed mm-hmm. within approaches. And Ramor de followed the approach, of course, of the Ben Ishchai because he's from uh, Iraq. So as well as Chacham uh, Ovadia. And I asked you a few moments ago, I'm not sure if you heard fully my question, there's a story of King Hussein flew uh, to Jordan, I believe a Chacham, I don't know if it was Chacham Ovadia or say a different Chacham, are you familiar with that particular story? Well, he himself piloted the plane. The plane. Oh, not that I, uh, no. not that I know. I have, of or not I have to I remember where I saw the story. It's a, it's a fascinating story. Certainly, Rabbi Avad Yosef had his influence not just in the religious world, but in the political world. And the few months now, you were even asked to head up the Shas division in the United States, which you didn't do. You spoke to Avad Yosef about that. Shas was a major party, a major change in the Israeli society that Chacham Rabbi Avad Yosef put together. Absolutely, it's definitely going to change now, without a question. Definitely going to change. No, his uh, his influence. I mean, look, look at the scenario. Gilad Shalit when he got freed without Rav Avad Yosef's permission, and granting then all all Shas members wouldn't have voted for it. They needed a, they needed a majority within the Knesset. So obviously his influence. You know, the, if he says jump, his Shas members say how high. You know that, that that's his. Uh, you know that that's definitely his impact within uh, within Israeli society as a whole. He was definitely rated within amongst newspapers and 
amongst the statistics and everything, the, the number one most influential rabbi within the past 65 years. There's a lot to say, and I, I don't think one biography could cover it. And there's definitely different approaches of different authorships that could have towards his life because he was sort of all over the place. He was, uh, if one looks in his Sfarim, he quotes Sir Moses Montefiore. He quotes science. He quotes everything. It, it's well, phenomenal. Well, with his he travels well, around the world within his Sfarim. Now that unfortunately you passed away, will that expedite your coming out of your book? Pardon? With Rabbi Vadia Yosef's passing, will that expedite the publishing of your book on the life of Rabbi Vadia Yosef? It will definitely, uh, it's going to, I mean, the intention is that it comes out within within the year. They, they, I definitely have to uh, hurry it up in the sense that uh, other authors may come out with. And uh, and we're speaking with Yehuda Zulai. He's writing a biography, as you heard, on Chacham Avad Yosef, who just passed away. He's the founder of the Sephardic Legacy Series and also the inaugural Tribute Luncheon honoring the contribution of Sephardic Jewry in America November 20th on Capitol Hill. When we come back, we'll look more at the legacy of Rav Avadi Yosef after these messages. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the program. I'm Zev Brenner Yehuda Azulay, our guest. He's written five books on Sephardic Jewry. He's the founder of the Sephardic Legacy Series. And he's also writing a book about the Rav Vad Yosef, a bayou, about the Chacham who just uh, passed away. He is the founder of the Sephardic Legacy Series, the Institute for Preserving Sephardic Heritage. And they are presenting an inaugural tribute luncheon honoring the contribution of Sephardic Jewry in America on Capitol Hill November 20th. He's the assistant professor at York University and assistant principal of Torah High, part of NCSY. And we're looking at the Rabbi Vadi Yosef's legacy. Now, he, of course, was a dynamic force in the growth of Sephardic Jewry. But on his watch, too, you mentioned before that he was lenient in his rulings, but yet under his time at the helm, Sephardic Jewry, to a certain degree, has changed. I would call it Ashkenazified, because you have more of the yeshiva influence and more of the Haredi influence in the Sephardic world. So on the one hand, he was leaning. On the other hand, he presided over the fact that it's changed. At least some elements of the Sephardic Jewry in Israel has changed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I believe that he was very influenced, and um, he sort of had no choice. And, what do you um, mean he had no choice? He had no choice in order to be accepted into the yeshiva world, um, where basically the Sephardic rabbinical world w- were strongly affected by the general shift to the right. And indeed, most Sephardic rabbis, whether you like it or not, were trained in Ashkenazic yeshivot and as well as Sephardic yeshivot. And they adopted Ashkenazic modes of Torah study and halachic decision making, and, ad- and it as well as adopted Ashkenazic garb. I mean, like, I'll give you a perfect example Rabbi Benzion Abashaul, one of Rabbi Avad Yosef's. Um, uh, how do you call? It? He he learned with him growing up. When One of his 12, disciples is tell me and so on. When it's he ten. um he didn't want to wear a, a a long jacket and a hat at at a, at a certain point, and it's and it's and it's phenomenal to see that because he was enough. He didn't. It sort of raised the status of who he was, and these these garments didn't represent anything in Sephardic jury, and until recently it did, and I and and I know for a fact that this is changing the mindset of many Sephardic Jews. So was he comfortable with that? Because in essence, he was part of it. He was, he was part, part of, of that because change. I, I think it was a part of him being accepted, him wanting to be accepted. I know someone who approached Rav Mordechai and complained about this scenario. It was to mainly, mainly identify yourself as a pure Sephardic individual and a Sephardic community, and uh, don't adopt anything else. Of, of other cultures, and of course respect and so on, and uh, Rabbi Mordechai told him, don't waste your time, the, uh, it, it's too late. That's exactly what he said to a rabbi in, in, in New York. So I think it was, ba- it was based on acceptance, and as well as... So what you're saying well is, is that the Sephardic r- r- rabbinate want to be accepted by the Ashkenazic Torah world, so they adopted the customs and dress and style and halachic decision-making akin to the what they learned in Ashkenazic yeshivas. Absolutely, 100%. Did Rabbi Vadi Yosef himself study in Ashkenazic yeshivas? Yes, he has. He's, uh, he's actually studied with Rabbi Tzal Zolti, Rabbi uh, Tzvi Pesach Frank, and, uh, and many others, many other Ashkenazi uh, Gedolim, as well as Shlomo Zalman Orbach. And, um, 
and he mainly attended Porat Yosef, and mainly Sephardic yeshivot, but at the end of the day, most of his influence were from Sephardic leaders, but as well as he not only encountered, but he engaged with uh, constantly, not just in learning, whether it's politics, like for example, Rav Yashiv, Rav Shalom Yashiv, they sat in the Betin for 40 years. But he also sat in the Betin with uh, other Sephardic rabbinical authorities. So uh, he, he had both, definitely he was all-encompassing in both, and um, if it was up to him, I think he would definitely keep 100% fully, and not just the Sephardic garbs, which uh, is not as important, but within the Havara, the pronunciation. I, mean, I just believe everybody should be, whoever they're, the way they're born is, is the way they should leave this world. If one is Hasidic, one is Hasidic. If one is Reformed, let them be Reformed, let them be who, are, who they are. But at the end of the day, of course, okay, granted, in that scenario, you could do Kiruv, but if you're Sephardic, why change yourself? There's a sense of, of, of inferiority within the Sephardic world. And I know he tried to boost that up, and he did, to a certain extent. And uh, and that's that. So but when he became powerful, he wasn't able to go back and say, "Listen, I want to that the community should stick more to the Sephardic uh, customs." He definitely did. He definitely accomplished it again to an extent. But I think the world as a whole, um, especially after the Holocaust, and and for many, um, I guess within the, within what was going on in the world within the past fifty years, the whole world as a whole, correct me if I'm wrong, shifted more to the right. So that was naturally uh, evolving, and I think he was just a part of that. And in order to be accepted a part of that world, he had to uh, he had to be totally fully engaged and adopt certain things. But I don't, I don't think he, generally speaking, adopted customs and pronunciations. That definitely he did not do. On the contrary, he actually he actually criticized um, different pronunciations, and he felt that Avraham Avinu said it said Yitzchak instead of Yitzchak, and so on and so forth. And th- th- there's YouTube videos on that. He definitely did, but I think the problem is the next generation. He isn't, God forbid, he is, n- he is not the issue. He's a Chacham, he's a Tzaddik, and it's going to be definitely deeply missed for generations to come. It's the next generation for Sephardic juries, what, personally, I worry about, as well as many other Sephardic scholars, and it's very scary. Now, the founding of the Shas party, was that done through the Ashkenazic, was that done through the, also for the Haredi, Ashkenazic Haredi community? Was that the influence him to form Shas, or did he do it on his own? It started from Rav Eliezer Manshach, the Rosh Hashiva of Panovich in Bnei Brak, mm-hmm. and where it eventually led to the hands of Rav Avad Yosef. Was Rav Shach, was Rav Shach he, had any hand in that too at those days? Yeah, absolutely, but there was unfortunate little drift between the two, a little rift between the two, and um, for a few years. And at the end, before Rav Shach's life, they, of course, uh, made up the two, Chacham Ovad Yosef and Rav Shach. Because uh, Rav Ovad Yosef, so if, you, if you take his past history, he was always, Oh, Shalom, Ve'radev Shalom. It doesn't matter the differences. So certainly that uh, that was that was a, a big moment in Israeli history. The form of the Shas Party had a lot of influence, of course, on the success of Israeli governments. No, absolutely, they're very influential. They definitely accomplished within a lot of just not just Sephardic society, but generally Israeli society. But of course, they had their own personal issues, whether being arrest and so on and so forth and corruption. But um, that's a do- different story within itself, and. Now, the new chief rabbi of Israel is the son of Rabbi Avadi Yosef, and uh, do you see that same legacy being carried on through his son, the same I style? I hope, and I pray, and I'm actually happy you, you mentioned that because I actually learned under him in Yeshiva Chazon Avadi for six months when I, was in his yeshiva, when I was in Yeshiva. His goal and objective in life is to follow his father's footsteps. So I don't think he is as charismatic and has as much as PR in the sense as being a chief rabbi that's sort of very well known in comparison to Rabbi Lau, but I, 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 do, I do hope, I really hope, and to follow in the footsteps not only of Rabbi Vad Yosef, but as well as of the other previous chief rabbis who are more, a bit more encompassing of the Sephardic traditional world, like Rabbi Uziel and Rabbi Tzach Nisim and many others. So I really hope so. He has a lot on his shoulders, and I hope he follows not only his father's footsteps, but many of the past Sephardic, uh, Sephardic leaders. Will they help you, or will they give you assistance uh, as far as getting more material for your book that should be out within the year? The family, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'm working with Tzvi Chakak, the Shamash, and many others, and family and friends. Some people are interested, some people are not. But now, as if today is the Yom Oskar, the, the day of his passing, I have to uh, see once I go and take a visit to Israel and conduct more research. But I'm sure that shouldn't be a problem. 
I want to thank you, Yehuda Azulai, for being with us. He's writing a bio on the late uh, charismatic tzaddik, spiritual leader, Chacham Avad Yosef, who just passed away. He's a founder of the Sephardic Legacy Series and the inaugural tribute luncheon and honoring the contributions of Sephardic Jewry to America, which will take place, God willing, November 20th on Capitol Hill. He's assistant professor at York University, assistant principal at Torah High, part of NCSY. Thank you for being part of our broadcast, sharing some light on the rich legacy of Chavcham Avadi Yosef. Thank you so much. It's my honest pleasure. And we're going to be right back. Don't go away. Stay tuned.